it didn't go so well for Gordon Brown. He wasn't really looking at their responses and engaging. He was just going, tell them about childcare tax credits, tell them, you know. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Women With Balls, where I, Katie Balls, speak to today's trailblazers. My guest today began her career working in finance, but soon after becoming a mother, she had a bold career change. In 2000, she founded Mumsnet, arguably the most influential online forum in the UK. Designed for parents, mainly mothers, Mumsnet has 8 million visitors each month and 1.2 billion page views. A haven for women to learn, comment and exchange views on issues from baby names to who they're voting for in the next election to what's just driving them mad that day. Mumsnet users have grilled multiple political leaders, first David Cameron, then Gordon Brown, Ed Miliband and most recently Boris Johnson in the last weeks of his premiership, so it didn't go particularly well. Celebrities have featured too. In the early years, my guest led her operation as a young mother in her spare bedroom. Now she runs it from Kentish Town with 75 staff. My guest today is Justine Roberts. So Justine, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Pleasure. Um, to begin with, we ask, uh, would you describe yours as a happy childhood? Um, yes, I think it was a happy childhood. I sort of remember uh, being quite bored a lot, um, especially on Sundays. Um, I was the third child and my parents both worked... And I think, like, you know, I have four children now and I'm definitely less attentive of the fourth than I was of the first. So I think I had a lot of freedom and independence. Um, but, yeah, um, I remember being stuck in Surrey with nothing to do a lot. That was my biggest memory. Um, you mentioned that you li- liked playing football growing up. Um, I was, yeah, I was mad into sports. And actually, I was kind of, I got into football despite none of my family really being into football. Um, at the age of seven and became and have been ever since a mad Liverpool supporter so that was kind of here I was this girl from Godalming um, with obsessed by sort of Bill Shankly and Kevin Keegan Um, but yeah I did I also played an awful lot of sport myself. Um, You went on to study PP at Oxford so at school were you like a straight A student? Um, yeah, I mean, I was, uh, yeah, two shoes or <laughs> I wasn't a goody two shoes. No, I definitely wasn't that. Um, and I remember disruptive featuring occasionally in my reports. Um, but yes, I sometimes joke I went to do PPE, but actually I did PE in, in sports again at uni. So, you know, I didn't study as hard as I, I wished I had now. Um, and uh, I often think, God, what an opportunity that I, all those great professors and I, w- I really didn't turn up for many lectures. So I was on the sports field. I always wondered, I went to Durham, which is obviously not qu- quite the same high esteem, but I thought at Oxford it might be harder to duck out of things in terms of the structure. I think it is now, yeah. but I'm quite old. And <laughs> um, now PPE is obviously the go-to degree for politicians. Liz Truss, the new Prime Minister, studied PPE at Oxford. Um, so did you have political ambitions? Um, I, I, th- I was very interested in politics, but I always thought of myself as a sort of an outsider looking in and, and someone who is more likely to sort of lob a stone into the pond than, than be one of the establishment, as I thought of them. I was actually asked... At one point, by the coalition government, Nick Clegg asked me to join the government and uh, go into the Lords and be a junior minister for families, which I think was the last de- desperate attempt um, from them as an election loomed. Um, and I, I remember asking him, can I do it part time because I, I'm, I'm doing mum's debt? And he looked a bit shocked by that. But I, at that stage, I thought, well, it's not really me. I'm, I'm, I'm not really one to toe a party line. Um, so I suppose I, 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 yeah, I, I don't, I would never say never though, because I think as things become increasingly sort of desperate and polarized, I think sometimes you, you've, you've got to, you've got to get involved. So, so wasn't right then, but not, but there is a chance not ruling anything out in the future. No, I wouldn't rule anything out. <laughs> um, and now, so when you graduated from Oxford, you went to finance what was yes. the thinking there? Well, it wasn't really thinking. I, I got some work experience in my second year, which my mum my my mom and dad weren't really very well connected, but they had my mum had been a secretary for a guy who ended up being chairman of an bank, uh, investment bank. And so I just thought, oh, I'll go and give that a try. And I ended up on the trading floor of the stock exchange, one of two women. And I sort of kind of fell in love with it, in, in just in the sense of, I guess little bit was trying to prove myself 
So with with sort of no real vocation or, or clear idea of what I wanted to do, I thought, oh, well, I'll go and do that for a bit and see what happens. And then I spent 10 years doing it in various different roles. I, and I tried everything. I was a I was a trader, and then I was a economist, and then I was a strategist, and then, and then, and then, and then. When I realised what I was really trying to find was the right cultural fit, which was going to be impossible. Um, so I would say I had some good experience, but it was a, it was a it was not really me. So what decade are we in at that point? We're in. Well, that's a good question. So yeah, I mean, it would be it would be nineties. Yeah. Right. So. I imagine '90s to be quite. Maybe I'm imagining like the strip club era. <laughs> you were and right. Yeah. I mean, some dreadful things happened. I remember going to a Chinese restaurant with a hot plate, and and these people were throwing money onto the hot plate and burning it. I mean, it was incredibly misogynist. Um, it was incredibly, yeah, a homophobic, racist, everything. And I was just trying to sort of prove that I was as good as the guys. And and I now look back and thought, think. You know, a little bit regretfully that I didn't make more fuss. Yeah. Um, I was just sort of putting my head down and saying, well, I can do this better than you, even though you will expect me not to. Um, and then I went, I, I ended up going to America and working in New York on Wall Street for a few years, which was actually a much better environment for women because they'd, they sort of, yeah, there'd been a lot of lawsuits and it was much better for all minorities. And, uh, um, and, and when I eventually came back to the city, I, I lasted about six months because I could not stomach it anymore. Um, and so when you decide to leave the city, you obviously were going to try journalism. But is that before or after you start a family? So, yes, both. Um, so I, I, I left when I was pregnant, knowing I can't have a family and work in, in this environment. Because the women who, who had got on in the city had done so by pretending their children didn't exist really um so I thought and, and okay. were you almost seen differently once you had a child in the industry or I, uh, well they, they literally hid it so they would work even longer hours never go home never be there for bath time and be more sort of masculine than the men sort of Margaret Thatcher-esque really um so um I, when I got pregnant I, I realized it wasn't for me and I left and I followed my passion which was football and to, and cricket and I started writing match reports I sort of d- I went and did a bit of um I shadowed a guy who, who a lovely old guy who used to write match reports and and then I submitted some to the times and they said yes you can do this I think actually probably quite helped by being a woman because it was unusual um and I did that whilst I was pregnant with twins which caused some consternation in the uh, in the press box and certain managers were very rude um and then afterwards when my when my twins were sort of what you know up till the age of three and I'd started mum's net concurrently but I carried on doing weekend match reports and why were they rude just because they didn't think you should be yeah no one I remember I think it was Joe Royal who was the manager of Manchester City said literally you you know you you should get back to the kitchen sink glove when I asked a question I mean this was before ladettes and women had really got into football there were very few female reporters so uh yeah and there was I with my enormous stomach (laughs) I think they were all very shocked create space for yourself you're doing it (laughs) yeah um um, so uh you mentioned mum's net there can you for listeners can I think everyone has now heard of mum's net most people have been on it but also just balls but if we rewind to when you were just thinking about launching it, how did it come about? When did, where did the idea exactly come from? Well, it was in the... Uh, it, you remember the sort of gold rush days of the internet where everyone was having a web idea. So you kind of had to have an idea. Um, and mine was the germinated from a really disastrous first family holiday. So we'd taken our one-year-old twins abroad and we chose everything wrong it was the wrong supposed to be a family friendly resort and it certainly was and it was the wrong resort wrong destination wrong time zone frankly the wrong children and it was just the worst holiday ever and everyone was around the pool saying why did we pick this place and my light bulb was yeah I, I would have loved to have known before I'd gone from other parents who'd been there and done that and it's not just holidays it's everything it's uh, we're not trained to be parents and you've got all these people who've been there and done that and, and got the baby sick on the t-shirt and it would be nice to tap into their wisdom and the internet was just starting and seemed like the perfect vehicle for that so that was the idea and I was kind of in a space to come back and try it because I'd left my 
reasonably high paying job and I'd sort of done my time, my 10 years earning money. And I thought, OK, I can probably take a risk. And if it fails, uh, I'll, I'll do it in a nice way with my kids around and I'll have a lovely, you know, family first environment to work in. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way, but but it was uh, it was a gamble I could take. Um, so at that point, how do you go about how do you go about from having an idea to then actually getting the funding, setting up? <laughs> yes. Well, no, we, we didn't get I've, any. We I, didn't I, get any funding. So I came back and I wrote in a friend from antenatal class, and I wrote in another friend who fortunately had learnt to code. Um, so he was um, working full time somewhere else, but in his evenings, he he was able to code. A website for us um, and we went on the trail of raising money and I had this business plan and was asking for four and a half million quid or something and luckily I think in the end the dot-com bubble burst and no one raised any money and that was actually quite fortunate because the right model really was organic growth from on a very low cost uh, basis because we were six years before really Facebook arrived and no one really understood the um the social web as it's now called uh and we all my business plan was not worth the paper it was written on and um, people were still on dial up it took i remember doing i was an early adopter of internet shopping and doing my tesco shop and it used to take four hours from start to finish so it was it, we, were, we were kind of a bit before our time um and luckily we were able to do it very slowly on very low cost uh, you know from a back bedroom which and build the community while the sort of business models evolved and during that period how do you get people to join mumsnet is it just kind of word of mouth initially or it was i mean it started and off literally having to message lots of yeah well yeah, yeah. so <laughs> it started off literally with us going round to sort of uh I know, at one o'clock clubs and, and baby singing groups and, and giving a pitch. And we were collecting reviews for push chairs and things. But uh, but there was this forum, which we hadn't really envisaged, but, um, yeah, the guy who could code said to me, do you want a forum? And I said, how much is it? And he said, $50. And I said, OK, let's have a forum. And I was largely talking to myself under multiple nicknames, asking lots of questions. Luckily, I had lots of questions, so... So would you reply to yourself? I would reply to myself with a different... Try and show this, like there's a conversation exactly, going, you should join exactly. it. And, um, and then eventually, I remember a friend of mine rang me up and said she was pregnant and she asked me whether I'd had some symptom of pregnancy. And I said, well, yes, I do know all about that, but I'm only going to answer you if you ask on mum's net. So I felt a bit guilty and rushed on to answer her question and two people had responded and I realised, OK, the word's getting out a bit. And I was lucky enough actually to be asked to write a diary of a dot-com startup for The Times and that definitely brought us some users. Um, but we've never spent any money on advertising. It's all word of mouth, really. Um, and were there any points in the early days where you just like, what am I doing? <laughs> um, it did seem like, I mean, well, it was we, it was always obvious once we began to get people using it that it was useful, and uh, and and literally people would say, you know, this has saved my life because it's helped me learn to breastfeed, or I've found someone else who's going through the exact same problem as me. But the money thing, really, I mean, we just no one trusted the social web, no brands were interested, we were too small anyway. Um, and lots of people then were saying the internet's a flash in the pan. I mean, it's hard to believe that now. But um, So it did seem like, I'm not sure this is ever going to make any money, but it was felt like a valid and useful thing to be doing. Um, and then I, I suppose at what point then, what are the milestones when it suddenly actually is it's really taking off and you're like, it's not just a nice hobby. Yes. This is now a business that... Yeah, I think two things happened around about the same time, 2006. Um, one was um, we were ne memorably sued by the most fi famous childcare author of the time, uh, a lady called Gina Ford. And that became kind of front page news because she was essentially suing us and threatened to have us taken down and sued our ISP and all kinds of things because of something someone else said about her on our forum. And she was quite a polarising figure who caused quite a strong opinions in mums. Um, and so it was kind of became a test case for, for the web and, and uh, publishers on the web. Um, and it sort of revealed that the internet had libel laws hadn't really caught up with. They were still basically seeing 
a site like Mumsnet as a newspaper and that we had editorial control over things. So that that became, you know, it was huge publicity and it actually led, I think it led Channel 4 News and things like that. So we got a lot of publicity from that. And then David Cameron came on to do a web chat. I think it was the first sort of major event he had after becoming leader. And so I think, you know, since then, the Mumsnet web chat, the sort of rite of passage of a politician, um, has sort of become more established, and that's... Uh, How did you convince him to come on? Did it, did it take much convincing, or did he already was he already quite aware of it? It was um, actually, I mean, um, I think it was his advisor, Steve Hilton, was very into... Uh, not wearing know, shoes and also... Yeah, well, not wearing <laughs> shoes, and also, you know, the community, as we get real people... Um, I think they, politicians are always obsessed with getting the women's vote because they view it as more floating. Um, and he wanted to be seen as modern. So I'm a modern guy who understands the internet and can yeah. engage with people. Um, you mentioned David Cameron was the first, obviously, like you know, and since then it's become a bit of a rite of passage. Mm. And I think that... Um, for those people who perhaps aren't on Mumsnet, uh, I think they've all read about Mumsnet when it's near an election and, um, you know, people. I think it's gone so far, as you mentioned, it's almost this idea of the floating voter, but people say, you know, Mumsnet can win or lose an election. Mm. Um, do, do you think that's the case? Well... <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to do down your brand. <laughs> um, I think it is true that a high proportion of um, female voters are less tribal and, and often more floating. The, what isn't true is that there is a mum's net vote that votes always this, you know, that all the women on mum's net are suddenly going to vote Tory or Labour. Um, we have, you know, we've got 8 million users and they are all political persuasions. So um, you, it's no, there's no such thing as you're going to win the mum's net vote, but you are talking to a lot of women who maybe haven't quite decided how they're going to cast their vote. So I think... Yeah, it's not it's not going to decide elections, but I would think it's a valid place to go and do if you're in your election campaign to go and talk to a, this constituency is not a bad idea. And um, which politicians do you think have uh, done the best or struggled the most when it comes to their their time of mum's net? <laughs> well, the, the ones that do the best are the ones that, as I say, show a bit of leg and join in the sort of nature of the conversation, which is a two way conversation and real engagement and not just giving stop politicians answers. So, uh, who springs to mind? Who's done that well? I think Michael Gove made quite a risque joke that was quite fun for people. And what uh, was that one again? What was the joke? Uh, I, so, is it is appropriate to say on an air? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure actually. I'm not sure if it is appropriate. Um, it was. Um, oh, I can't actually remember. No, don't worry, don't worry. I can't actually remember. But um, it was quite funny. Um, but who else has done well? Um, yeah, I think anyone who's prepared to really engage and, and um, um, say things in an authentic way. Um, I think he, he obviously notoriously, he, it didn't go so well for Gordon Brown, who um, came, he didn't really understand the format and he came with a load of messages and he was broadcasting. So, um, and ultimately our users clocked on to the fact that he wasn't really looking at their responses and engaging and that's why they asked what his favourite biscuit was 12 times and that notoriously then uh, became Biscuit Gate and David Cameron used it to say how indecisive Gordon Brown was but he, it wasn't that he was indecisive he just wasn't looking he wasn't he just he was just going tell them about childcare tax credits tell them you know <laughs> um, so it is it's a test of how well people engage with the medium really. Um, and you had a Mumsnet poll, I think, during the Tory leadership, and Liz Truss did, did not come out on top, is that right? No, she came bottom, actually, of the five yeah. candidates that were still involved at that stage. Um, and Rishi Sunak came second bottom, and I think that was partly because it was a vote against the current government. I mean, I think people saw both of them as being involved in what they thought um, was quite a... Yeah, a bankrupt, corrupt party gate had just blown up. We'd had our interview to, and, and our users were really angry about what they saw as, you know, an abuse of power, really. Um, before I just ask you a few about just the present day, I wondered, are there any, I mean, we've all seen the news article, Sun and Senior, which is just a very funny conversation that's gone on a month's net. <laughs> um, <laughs> scale them. Are there any particular threads that you've, um, over the years, um, found like the most like quintessentially mum's net <laughs> uh yes but they're quite hard to sort of get across yeah. in on on 
on a podcast or on radio. Um, I mean, there's, there's, our users are really, really funny. Um, and I mean, just they're very quick-witted and, and, and it's an odd thing because people think mothers aren't funny. I mean, there's just a, you know, no one thinks their own mother's funny <laughs> or except to laugh at. Um, and I think, you know, the idea that middle-aged women can, can crack jokes. But I mean, uh, there are lots of examples of brilliant, brilliant, funny threads and and a lot of talk about you know sex so there was a pirate sex one and i know that the other thing people think women of a certain age never talk about sex and then i do wonder how that can be because we've all had babies so we all must know about sex but the, the one i mean an example with the gina ford thing she was immediately christened she who must not be named by our users because we banned all mention of her on the forums um there are there are all kinds of. I mean, I'm not giving you a very good answer. To this. <laughs> um, there's a brilliant thread called "Cut It Up Pear," which is written. Um, it's our, our users pretending they are toddlers talking to and about their mothers, um, and it's like my mother's a very difficult woman. She insists on cutting up my pear the wrong way and stuff like that. And it just goes on and on and on. And it's that's probably my favourite. Yeah, and where you wouldn't be able to get it anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Um, and you mentioned obviously sex, but one of the other things that's been the reason news recently has related to biological sex at mm. Um So I think this, there's been a fair bit on this, but there was a journalist for the New York Times who once was pondering um, why the UK elite has more TERFs. Uh, and I was, and concluded that the answer is mums now. Um, what did you make of that? Um, I, look, there are, we've had a feminism board on Mumsnet um, for, I mean, years, for at least 10 years. And... On that board, there are people who discuss, you know, this issue. Um, and I think lots of women, once they have children, become very aware of their biology. Um, and, and there are also lots of women who are quite concerned about kids and particularly medical intervention for kids who are transitioning and stuff like that. So I don't think it's a surprise that on a forum of, you know, 8 million women, you're going to get um, some conversation on this issue. Uh, we have chosen not to shut that conversation down. And I think that's, um, I think a lot of other places on the internet have, have, have shut the conversation down. And we've done that because we, we have a value which, uh, you know, we believe that discussion of difficult and contentious issues, as long as it's done civilly, will lead to resolution or is more likely to lead, read lead to resolution than just cancelling the conversation so we you know we have probably um you know put ourselves in the controversy because we've chosen not we, we think it's part of our values you know mum said it's about discussing things it's about parents being able to raise their concerns and as long as it's legal and as long as it's civil then we would find it very odd to shut that um, so it's kind of a bit freedom of speechy as well. Yeah, have you personally uh, been the subject of, of abuse because of that? Or, um, I mean, a bits and bobs, not nothing like. I mean, I haven't expressed my own personal yeah. opinion. Oh no, no, just for um, yeah, posting. I, I mean, I, you know, obviously, some people are angry that we let the, that conversation go on, um, but I mean, over the course of the twenty-three years now, almost that Mum's has been going. There have been huge amounts of abuse. I mean, I've been, I think I'm, I was the first person in the UK to be officially swatted where people, you know, um, I don't know if you know what swatting is, but basically it's a thing that gamers do in the US where they call the police and say there's a violent crime going on in a house and the police turn up with guns and dogs and um, yeah, um, it's a scary thing. Um, and I've had dirty underpants sent through to our offices by... Uh, fathers for justice type people okay, yeah um so you know my, we are a, we're unique really in in being a very busy high profile um, place where women collect on the web and it is mostly women and that causes quite a lot of um anger amongst some people yeah, so you've, you've had to develop pretty thick skin long yeah, before this. To, yeah you have to <laughs> yeah um just to find a few very um last ones one was um just Talking a bit about freedom of speech there, and I wondered, the online safety bill is obviously um, yeah. a big issue at the moment. There's some questions as to what the new Prime Minister Liz Truss will do on it. Uh, do, do you think that 
has a threat to some of the conversations if it goes through in its current form? I, I think it's a very woolly notion of psychological harm that that you know, we, you're supposed to not cause psychological harm. And having moderated a very busy forum with loads of people with, um, you know, lots of different ideas of what causes them harm, um, we are asked to make decisions on moderation every day. If we were to take down everything that someone thought had caused them psychological harm, there'd be very few conversations left on Mum's Dad. So I think that is woolly, and it's da- in, it's a dangerous thing that um, y- you could see that people would use it to tie websites like ours in knots and uh, cause a lot of sort of legal cases. So I, I'm, I'm quite worried about it, but I do think, well, I know... Because Liz Truss told me that um, she, I met her on the stairs once and she, I'd written a piece in the Times about this and she said, I think her words were, Justine, you and I are, are in danger of agreeing on too much. <laughs> you need to get uh, her uh, on for a, a politician I do, soon. I do need to get her on. Well, she's been on Mum's step before. It, yeah, didn't, it yeah. actually didn't go so well. Oh, what uh, this was wrong? Was, uh, she was talking about childcare ratios. You, it was yeah. her first it's attempt. Her big thing, yeah. To, yeah. And uh, I think there were... Th- 386 comments on the thread and not one of them supported her plan so yeah I think it's fair to say she didn't win the argument on that one on mum's net I think she, was this when she was a junior education yes, yes. I mean, she still wants to do childcare ratios so <laughs> hopefully she'll have better luck if she comes and tries to sell it uh, more of an argument yes, as I don't know I'm a little bit doubtful um just final two questions as one is um do you, when when it comes to the advice on the forums do you use them for to get advice ever or do you take the advice for your own life i mean always i have but i now i'm i'm now slightly dubious about posting even though you can be anonymous to my own team if they looked hard enough they could find out it was me so um i'm more of a lurker than a poster these yeah. days being a lurk is quite good. Um, <laughs> and then the final question is one that we just ask everyone who's been in this podcast, which is what is the worst advice you have ever been given? Um, I think it's this um, idea that you shouldn't say, if you haven't got something nice to say, don't say anything at all, which I think um, for a long time was sort of how I ran Mum's Net as a business. And I think it's particularly destructive. And we were we were all really nice to each other, but no one was giving any feedback um so no one really was learning and no one was improving and I'm now sort of um come to believe that and I think women get told this a lot is that actually you should be very forthright with your feedback as long as you're doing it in a kind enough way and I've adopted this approach called radical candor and we all use it in um in the organization and actually it helps people improve and as long as you're sort of generally caring personally giving in the moment feedback um in an effort to develop people and improve people i think really helps an organization so how do you do radical candor what, well what are the rules you, i might say to you katie um, oh God, don't you're, 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 me, <laughs> you're really good at this podcast but the coffee is really not up to scratch and then next time you, you could better coffee the yeah. producer under the, the bus and my place wouldn't even be red <laughs> no it's about it's a, it's about i mean it's about viewing feedback as a gift as a, you, if you want to actually help people but you've also got to remember to do the praise thing too so i would also say but by the way what brilliant questions yeah what a great mug <laughs> <laughs> Mm. <laughs> yeah, we're back to the today. Okay, brilliant. And um, thank you so much for coming on today, Jesse. Been a pleasure.